Hello and a warm welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. Well, it's regarded as the world's second largest coca producer and after South Africa, Africa's biggest gold miner. Ghana is one of the continent's fastest growing economies and the newest oil producer. This week we unpack some of the challenges and opportunities that this West African country is facing. Bordering the Gulf of Guinea between Cote d'Ivoire and Togo, over 25 million people inhabit approximately 230,000 square kilometers of land. Well endowed with natural resources, agriculture accounts for roughly one quarter of GDP and employs more than half of the workforce, which are mainly small landholders. The services sector is a significant contributor and accounts for 50% of GDP. Gold, cocoa and timber exports to France, the Netherlands and USA are major sources of foreign exchange. Imports such as capital equipment, petroleum and food products are sourced mainly from China, Nigeria and the US. The number two grower of cocoa was one of the world's fastest growing economies in 2011 after pumping oil for the first time at its Jubilee field in November 2010. This sent GDP soaring by nearly 15%. Sound macroeconomic management, along with high prices for gold and cocoa, also helped sustain GDP growth between 2008 and 2011. Ghana's economic growth is expected to slow down this year and cool even further in 2013, with growth expected to post at around 8.2 and 7.7% respectively. A key risk to the fiscal outlook for 2012 is the possibility of higher public spending and wage pressures from the implementation of the new pay policy. The West African country has remained an oasis of stability in a region that is plagued by coups and civil unrest. Ghana further solidified its political maturity after the death of Ghanaian President John Otto Mills. Ghana's Vice President John Mahama has since assumed the role of interim president. Even though analysts are not reporting on a significant impact by the unforeseen incident, the world is watching closely to see if the words of the late President Mills will be echoed by the new leadership. I hope that by the time I leave office, I would have helped to raise the living standards of our people. I would have helped to consolidate democracy, rule of law, justice, etc. And above all, I would have left behind me a peaceful and stable Ghana with the right kind of atmosphere for attracting investment. Well, joining me in studio to take a closer look at Ghana as a business and investment destination, Tabo Ngalo, Portfolio Manager, Stanlib Africa, Equity Fund, and Grant Hatch, Executive Director, Strategy Practice at Accenture Southern Africa. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your thanks time. Thanks, well, certainly the late President John Atomill is making all the right noises there in terms of what he was saying. Are we seeing, I know this is very new in terms of news flow, his death three weeks ago, but are we going to see the same polit policy implementation from the now interim president? I think, Bronwyn, we will, because I think the, the fact that the transition was so smoothly handled, I mean, there was a plan in place that the vice president stepped in, took on the role as interim president. Um, the fact that both the political parties vying for it are actually very similar, you know, centrist type parties bodes well for continued stability in Ghana and that's one of the reasons why as you know you highlight in the introduction that GDP growth has continued at, at quite high rates because of the high degree of political instability in quite an unstable region which is quite appealing for investors. Taba, this isn't a huge setback in your opinion? No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, for us, it's definitely not a setback. Uh, I think the primary reason for that, uh, it, as I think as Grant also alluded to, is, is you know, it, it's a handover from uh, the president to the vice president. They're in the same uh, party. So, I mean, I think also if you look at it, uh, he's essentially the caretaker president for the next six months or for the next sort of five months until the elections in December. Um, so, I mean, we don't expect much in terms of policy change. Uh, I think he'll continue as planned for the next uh, couple of months till the elections. And I think the, the real deciding point, I guess, will be what happens happens in, uh, in December because as we know Ghana is, uh, is you know is, 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 the, is a highly democratic country and I think the you know the split between uh, both political parties the ND, NDC uh, and the NPP I guess I guess it's, is, is very is very uh, small so so we can certainly expect fair and free elections with Definitely. not much policy change in terms of who comes mm -hmm. into the hot seat Absolutely. Grant 
I love Ghana. I've mm. been up in Accra recently mm. and I found it an amazing city. Mm. It, everything seems to work incredibly mm. well. I think it certainly mm. in, deserves um, mm. the accolades that it's been given as an investment destination and a hot mm. investment destination. What mm. do you deem most exciting about the territory? I think it, it, what's interesting is when you arrive for the first time at the airport and you're used to the sort of somewhat chaos of African airports and as you arrive and walk out, someone orderly tells you to keep moving. You know, and there's, there's, there's structure and order in the country. You get that sense of it from the time you arrive at the airport from the, from the outset. Absolutely. And Even so the visibility yeah. of the infrastructure, yeah. everything yeah. looks as though it's established moving in the right direction without the chaos that you yeah. sometimes Absolutely. encounter Absolutely. when you're yeah. traveling. Yeah. Tabu, in terms of obviously the top cocoa producer, big oil discoveries, that giving the economy a big kick, mm -hmm. do you think we are going to see this company, this country rather, starting to trailblaze? I, I, I think it will. I mean, if you if you look at the figures we uh, uh, you know on the inset that was shown earlier on in the inset, it's still showing growth of, of eight percent or seven percent for the next two years. And you know, it might have fallen from fourteen percent. It might be at eight percent, but eight percent is phenomenal by in this uh, by environment. Eight percent you know? is absolutely exactly, will take yeah. any day. So mm. so I, th I think we'll still see see rapid growth. And I think mm. as well from the rapid ramp up of oil. I mean, if you look at Ghana now, if you speak to the likes of Tallow Oil, uh, with some of the companies we speak and invest we invest in, mm. I mean, Ghana is looking at about eighty thousand barrels of uh, of 80,000 barrels of oil a day you know, in terms of production so so I think as that ramps up you know to the likes of Nigeria at two two and a half million barrels you know I, I think you, you, you're gonna see growth without a shadow of doubt mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna see growth you know from the agriculture space uh, food security is a big issue so so I think G Ghana will continue to grow uh, I think we we, we we still expect a lot of growth going forward from just the primary industries and services as, as, as was shown earlier as well how much interest are we seeing in the agro processing environment in Ghana well, I think it's across the whole region because I think what's what's really driving investment in agriculture and Nigeria sort of have this problem. So it's really interesting the parallels between what Nigeria went through and Ghana is that basically, you know, there's a lot of food import into countries like Nigeria. So the question is how quickly can countries develop their domestic agriculture sector, reduce dependency on food ex imports, so, you know, to reduce dependency on maize and commodities that are traded globally um, is really the key challenge. So the big question for, Ga for Ghana is having discovered oil now, do they go down a different development route to the one Nigeria did, where they focus strongly on oil at the expense of, of agribusiness and agriculture and then have to correct later, or do they actually continue to drive their sort of domestic agriculture sector? I mean, so, but given the point about political stability, my sense is that they are going to get this right because they're already doing a lot in that space, investing in agriculture. And they've got a lot of arable land still to develop, so it's encouraging. Do you believe, as Grant puts on the table, that they will get it right? They're not going to neglect the agri-environment now with this discovery of oil because it's a sexier environment. You, you know, we, we, we hope they, they'll keep the focus. Uh, and, and I think from all signs, from what we've seen over the last two years, I think, since oil was discovered, that, that that will remain a primary focus in terms of agriculture and other sectors of the economy. So, you know, essentially what's known as the Dutch disease, uh, we, I mean, we're effectively not seeing it at the moment in, in, in Ghana. So, I mean, we're hoping, uh, you know, agriculture will continue to be the pillar of the economy. But I think from our perspective, what we want to see um, is, is, is more um, commercial agriculture, agriculture, sorry, and I think we want to see uh, a bit more investment from, from companies and from banks especially. You know, if you look at uh, the agricultural sector in Ghana now, you know, it's, it's quite reliant on, on, uh, on rain. So if you've got uh, a bit of a dry season, then the cocoa production falls. So what you want to see is a bit of irrigation, a bit more organized uh, agriculture, so that whether there's rain or not, there's still irrigation systems in place. Uh, you know, they can, uh, they can keep up the, the production where, where it should be. So I think these are some of the companies, I mean, when you speak to companies, for instance, like Benzo Oil, which is also a listed company, uh, Benzo is a, is a palm oil producer. Um, so, I mean, some of the agricultural players are out there and, and, you know, they're just waiting for opportunities. What it's about the regulatory environment? Is there anything there to discourage, as you say, you would like to see more commercial farmers in country, you would like to see more investment from the private sector, from the financial sector? Is there anything at the moment that doesn't sit right with a foreign and direct investment on any of those fronts? I think it's, 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 it's coming in slowly, but I think it's not fast enough. I think what we've seen, unfortunately, is more FDI into the services sector, mainly banks and hotels and what have you. But agriculture, not as much. Uh, agriculture is still 
a very you know highly political sort of uh, a discussion I guess as well in Ghana because you're looking at a lot of small scale farmers in in, in Ghana a lot of outgrowers uh, that, that that you know sort of I mean the the growers aren't just it's not just one big farm I guess it affects many people in terms of many small producers I guess in, in communities so so it, it, it's still not uh, I guess as developed I guess perhaps in terms of just allowing perhaps uh, a lot more commercial investment but I think it's coming looking at the free trade enterprise or the free zone enterprise it sounds like that's the way to go if you are setting up a business in Ghana effectively you've got a 10-year tax holiday those kind of things make yeah. me very excited should we get excited about how you can do business well I think there are two things Brandon. one is is actually the macro trend of of the borders becoming much more porous. I mean, I think one of the issues, and it's actually been driven by slowdown in Europe, is that Africa is starting to trade much more interregionally, and actually the extent to which borders come down and helps a lot. So, you know, the fact that Ghana is contiguous with you know, Nigeria helps a lot in terms of that sort of regional trade, but also to what extent government policies actually stimulate local free trade zones and the tariff protection they put in place and the incentives. Mm -hmm. You know, that has a huge impact on on how domestic industry, from agriculture to manufacturing, will develop depends on those incentives. They're making the right noises though again going back to sure. what the late president was saying earlier in the show. Yeah. They, they're making the right noises and I think uh, even even just I mean Ghana is, is a very progressive country from uh, mm -hmm. I guess if you compare Ghana to almost every other country on the continent it's quite progressive from a political perspective uh, from from a policy perspective as well I think the way they've handled as well if you look at the way they've handled the, the you know the oil concessions in the Jubilee fields uh, it was it was very mature it was uh, you know allocated fairly and transparently mm -hmm. and I think it's, it, it's something you don't you know you rarely see across the mm -hmm. continent so, mm -hmm. so 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 Ghana is a model country I think and I think it's uh, you you know, some of these policies will come. Mm. Uh, I think at the moment the priority has been on oil, which is sort of clouding the, the rest of the, the economy. But but as you mentioned, you know, when you get to Accra, it's, it's fantastic to see just outside the, the airport, you know, the new uh, Holiday Inn hotels, you know, the infrastructure that's growing. So, you know, there's, the, the country's moving forward, and I think is, it's just a matter of What are of the time. problems, though? There must be some problems that still arise. I think everywhere, you know, you, you've got problems, and uh, education is still, is still one big issue. Literacy is still one big issue. And I think there are a lot of issues that still affect. Uh, uh, the communities and population in, in Ghana. Uh, infrastructure is a big issue, you know. Mm. Uh, I think infrastructure is a big issue all across the continent. And uh, I think when you just travel a little bit out of Accra mm. uh, and you drive out to Cape Castle or to, uh, you know, to uh, Takoradi or anywhere else, you start seeing the road infrastructure needs upgrade. So you're saying so. Accra belies what the, the rest of the country looks like. Don't take Accra as an indication of the infrastructure development across Ghana. That's true. I mean, it has to start with the capital cities naturally, mm. but, but I think it has to spread as well across the country. Yeah. But I think the infrastructure question is really important because if you look at the development in Ghana, it has been, you know, there's been a lot of development around elections and also events like sort of Africa Cup of Nations sort of, um, and then the infrastructure is developed to a point and then stops. So there's also a lot of shells of half-built hotels also around the airport in Accra that need to get developed. Um, and also to develop the infrastructure out to support agriculture because you're not going to create a vibrant agriculture economy without linking small-scale producers to commercial producers to supply chains and getting that integration working effectively. We're going for a quick commercial break. More on Invest Africa when we return. Stay tuned.